yeah. uh, we'd go to swimming meets and of course you'd get beat or you'd win or you'd play sure. fifth or whatever it was. And there were always coaches that would talk to my mom or dad. Did they talk to me? I mean, back in the day, no, you were there to race and swim. I just loved it. I loved the training. I loved the, the, the tenacity, the perseverance. I loved every aspect of racing, even sitting and being in a crowded gym of 400 swimmers, <laughs> getting ready to have your heat called and you're in this gymnasium and it's just. Hey, welcome back, Beast. It's your host from Beast Nation, Brad Blazer. As most of you that follow this podcast know, people refer to me as the Robin Hood of knowledge because I take information and knowledge from people that have it and I share it with people that seek it. And today's guest is no different than many of the others I've had on the show. She is no other than an Olympic gold medalist, Wendy Boglioli, who participated in the Montreal Olympics and has an amazing story to share. Welcome to Beast Nation today, Wendy. Hey, Brad. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, I'm so excited to really share your story with our listeners. Um, I think when you and I first met, I shared with you the fact that I've had other people, obviously, from sports. Dana Cavalier, of course, who was the performance coach for the New York Yankees, and Darren Miller, who is just an unbelievable long-distance endurance swimmer. Uh, and certainly, you're no different when it comes to talking about what it means to be a champion. But what I'd really like to start with today for the listeners is really to kind of go back into your what I call story. That's really your upbringing and really what it was that obviously was instilled in your upbringing that obviously uh, affected you growing up that ultimately led to become an Olympic champion. Yeah, and I appreciate always the opportunity. I, I, I honestly love my story. I, I it's really a wonderful love, story. I didn't grow up in California or Florida where great Olympic swimmers came from, you know, 40, 50 <laughs> years ago. I grew up in this little town in Land Lakes, Wisconsin, a town of 600 people that is still 600 people today. Mm -hmm. My my parents were not Olympic swimming coaches at all. My father knew nothing at all about swimming. Uh, my mother had been a competitive swimmer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up in Wisconsin, land of a thousand lakes, uh, they wanted us to learn to swim to be safe and hopefully save the life of a brother or sister or somebody else. And that's really the, the, what, what they wanted out of us. I'm one of seven children, uh, five girls, two boys, and I'm the second youngest. Uh, my mother having been a competitive swimmer and competed until she was 27 years old back in the day, she was also um, extremely athletic, well ahead of, of her time. She played on the, uh, the league of their own softball team yeah. during World War II, traveled the country, was a, was a catcher for the Wisconsin Cardinals. So this is a woman that was, again, ahead of her time, uh, extremely competitive. Uh, my father, World War II vet, farmer, and they find themselves in Land Lakes, Wisconsin, raising these seven kids. My father was a uh, electrical engineer at this hotel, the Gateway Hotel. Mm -hmm. My mother lifeguarded there. And they taught us how to swim in this little hotel that was 17 yard long pool. Uh, that's where I trained until I was 18 years old every single winter. In the summer, there was nothing available with that pool because it was a big vacation spot. So my yep. father, about a mile from our home, took my younger sister, Lori and I down to that lake we were seven, eight years old, and we trained in that lake every summer. He and I would build these starting blocks, lane lines, and our summer was set in this course in this lake. Um, I had, uh, you know, I just had great opportunities where everybody has no opportunity. The, this gal, she may say all she want is a 10-year-old and a 17-year-old. You're not going to make the Olympic team. Wendy Bolio, Wendy Lonsbach was saying, I'm going to make that Olympic team. Hmm. Brad, I never knew how I was going to do it, but I knew why I wanted to do it. And that was to stand up on that podium and have an Olympic gold medal around my neck. The how, there's, there's solutions for, for everything yeah. that you want to do. And so I wasn't concerned about that. The why to me was the most important thing. What a wonderful story. You know, at what age did either you or the people around you, your parents or your coaches, really recognize the fact that you were obviously an outstanding swimmer and perhaps with some coaching and training could actually go the distance because, you know, I believe that there are 
people in music that have talents that at a certain age, the people around them say, that's a prodigy. You know, with a little bit of nurturing and with the right coaching, this person could be playing Carnegie Hall. For you as a competitive swimmer, you know, was it in junior high? Was it in high school? At, at what stage in your career did people realize, you know, with the right coaching and training, she could be on the podium as a gold medalist? Well, I all, honestly, if you had asked me as an eight-year-old, I would have said <laughs> because I loved it. I loved the feel of the water. I loved, I loved the competition. I loved all of that. Did, did I lose a lot of races? Oh, yeah, of course I did. I, as every elite athlete will tell you, they lost more than they ever won. Sure. But what I loved was the competitive part of it. My mm -hmm. parents, they coached me until I was 18. Our, our, I went to grade school with, I had 14 kids in my grade school. Eighth mm -hmm. grade graduating class. I went on to high school. There wasn't a, a high school swimming program. They didn't have a pool, so I didn't have I didn't have other coaches around me saying, "God, Wendy, this gal is great." Yeah, uh, we'd go to swimming meets, and of course, you'd get beat, or you'd win, or you'd play sure. fifth, or whatever it was. And there were always coaches that would talk to my mom or dad. Did they talk to me? You know, I mean, back in the day, no. You were there to race and swim. I just loved it. I loved the training. I loved the, the, the tenacity, the perseverance. I loved every aspect of racing, even sitting and being in a crowded gym of 400 swimmers, <laughs> getting ready to have your heat called and you're in this gymnasium and it's just, cr I just love that whole, I just love that whole atmosphere. Mm. Um, my parents though, absolutely recognized talent in my younger sister and, and, and I, and Lori went on to win three Pan Am gold medals uh, American and world record holder uh, in the early 80s. So, oh. you know, they, they recognized that we had this discipline and absolute talent and that we just didn't give up despite yeah. despite the lack of opportunity in a little 17 yard long pool in a lake. I mean, they I never felt like I couldn't achieve. But I also had a father, Brad, that if it wasn't every day, almost every day at many times a day would grab me by the shoulders <clears throat> and tell me, Wendy, you are great. And when you hear that your whole in your life, you know what? You gain a confidence, you gain a belief and, and, and a passion for what you do. And it really wasn't until my father was long gone and I had kids of my own that I understood that my dad wasn't talking about me being great as a swimmer and an athlete. Yeah. My dad was saying, Wendy, you are great as a human being. And mm -hmm. you know, that's what I had with me. And that's what I've carried through in my entire life, that, that same attitude and same attitude of others. I love that, you know, it's getting back to what Napoleon Hill and Zig Ziglar have said so eloquently, you know, you are what you think about all of the time or life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, you know, I think two of the most powerful words in the entire English language are actually two of the smallest and they're the words I am. And so when you associate something powerful like great to I am, it defines your belief system. And we all know, of course, in coaching and training that your beliefs define your reality. So there's no surprise to me that you went on, obviously, to achieve great things in your life because you were hearing that from those people around you that loved you the most, your father, obviously, and your family. But it sounds to me like, you know, you obviously grew up uh, in a family of athletes, like you said, your sister and, of course, your mom. I'm assuming that on this journey as an Olympic athlete, which I know is hard work because I've been an athlete myself, a triathlete and a long distance endurance rather, there must have been times along the path or the journey that you wanted to quit or give up. Um, were, there, were there points in your career uh, swimming competitively that you wanted to give up or you wanted to quit or was this just a passion of yours throughout your entire life or you just kept going the distance? You know, interestingly, um, certainly, certainly as it got closer and I got older, I'd have to say, did I want to quit? Oh, probably every week I would say that <laughs> to myself because the, the workouts are so intense. Your double workouts, your weight training, you've got the whole mental aspect. You're going to school. Yeah. Um, you're, you know, you, you've got all of that. I had all of that, just like every elite athlete. Um, workouts were always intense and you always, you know, you didn't go into workout every single day, twice a day. And yes, you did the best that you could, but would that be good enough? And, you know, I had a, I had a coach, Bill Palmer, when I turned 18 and went off to college that, you know, he just, he just beat you. I mean, he just, I mean, your workouts were year intense. If you weren't throwing up at the end of most of your workouts during that week, you didn't train hard enough. And that was Bill. I love that about Bill. 
and Bill and I had just this incredible relationship because he could get out of me. And my parents always said that, you know, they, they had me in great shape. I had the perfect stroke so that they always said, when you go away to college and you find another coach, all they're going to have to do is build your strength because everything for you is set mentally and your stroke is, but all you need to do is gain strength. Somebody is going to see that in you. And Bill yeah. Palmer did that. You know, quitting, boy, we work out sessions that, you know, you had get out swims. You had swam, you know, maybe 8,000 meters before in your morning workout. Now you're in the middle of a set and you got, I don't know, another six meters again at night. Halfway through that night set, Bill would call me out and he'd go, Wendy, you're going to do a get out swim. If you can come within a tenth uh, uh, or a, th uh, a second of an American record, a second of American record right now, this whole team gets out. And we're not saying, we're not saying you get out of a two hour practice. It's like <laughs> you get out 15 minutes early. I mean, talk about, God, am I good enough? Yeah. Can I do this? Because I think one of the great aspects of a team sport and people don't think of swimming as a team sport is that it really is a team sport and you've got, you've got a responsibility and an obligation. Uh, and when you've got a team of that kind of support, the quitting becomes less of an issue. You think about it, but you're like, I'm not letting anybody down. You know, it's interesting what you just said, and I want to dig a little deeper in that um, because I think there's a great message there. And it's the message that I share with people that are in our coaching program uh, called Build a Beast. And it's really understanding that to really do something hugely great in life, you have to almost flip a switch. You have to say to yourself, I'm going to put my amateurish ways behind me and I'm going to go pro and I'm going to live life like a champion. And that was such a defining message when I had Dana Cavalia, who of course coached the New York Yankees, one of the winningest teams in major league baseball that, you know, these players that show up at the very highest levels it's like they're in the last 30 seconds of the Super Bowl and they're down two points and they realize, man, we got to give it everything we got. Um, so for you, what does it mean in your life to live as a champion? You know, what, what message would you have to other people that are struggling or that feel like they're stuck where, you know, my personal philosophy is we were all born as 12 cylinder Lamborghinis designed to go 150 miles an hour, but you got a whole class of people putting along like six cylinder Yugos. So I think there's some message that perhaps you can share as an Olympic medalist to people as it relates to what does it mean to be a champion? What does it mean to be a, a, an Olympic swimmer? You know, what is the grit, the grind, the hustle that's behind all of that hard work? might be cliche, but I've always felt this in my life. It really honestly is that journey. Mm. It is that journey to be the best that you can be. And however you stand up on in my sport of swimming, you know that when you've gone to the block, you've done the very best that you possibly can. Now, yeah. through all of that, there can be injuries, illnesses, all of that. And the setbacks can be astronomical. I mean, I look at Montreal. I mean, we went into Montreal those Olympic 76 as the best United States women's swimming team that has ever walked the planet in the yep. country. We were the best. We hadn't been shut out of an Olympic gold medal since 1952. So mm. we went in with extreme confidence. And what we saw was every single day, the East German women who were doped and the wall came down in 89 and, and that was all proven. So yep. they were, had all been doped from the time they were 11 and 12 years old. They came on the scene and were winning every event. By the last day in our swimming, <clears throat> um, that week of swimming in, on that Sunday of that relay, East Germany had won 11 of the 12 Olympic gold medals, most of the silver and almost every single bronze medal. So our, you know, talk about what that means to be a champion. If, if you didn't love that journey and if you didn't push back all the crap, honestly, all the negativity, yeah. and there was so much that week in Montreal, I tell you one thing, when we stood on the block to swim that race, if we had let that whole thing not be, you know, not be in our head, but embraced the greatness that we really are and, and had that belief and had that confidence and had that commitment mm -hmm. and had acted, when we stood up on that block, history would have remembered us very differently if we had let that get to our head. I think that's part of being a champion. I think being mm -hmm. a good person, being kind, having empathy toward others, those are things that I carry all through my life with people mm -hmm. that I meet, the relationships that I have. It's not just about competing. It, it is. 
but it's about being the best that you can possibly be, not only for yourself, obviously, but for every single person around you. Yeah, you know, it is. And what you said is so beautiful. I remember watching Matthew McConaughey when he won the 2014 Academy Award. And he basically said, you know, I want to thank three people here. One, of course, was uh, the Lord. He's a somewhat religious. And of course, he's prayed for success throughout his career. Uh, the second, of course, was his wife, Camilla, and of course, his family. And he said, the third person I want to thank, and he paused, and you would think he would say someone like Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise. He said, I want to thank myself because I'm chasing myself every single day. It's the desire to become a better version of myself that pushes me as an actor and, you know, when you watch him in the performance, of course, in the Dallas Buyers Club, which is what he won the Academy for, just what a phenomenal role that was. And just the, the test on him as an actor to lose all of the weight to essentially, you know, become an AIDS victim. Uh, but it was really, it's the message you just shared. It's constantly pushing yourself. You know, as a runner, we call it PR, personal record, trying to shave a few seconds off your best 10K or your best 5K. Same thing, of course, in swimming. It's every time you get into that pool, like you said, shaving a tenth of a second, right? And just right. consistently getting better. What's it going to be this time? Is it my stroke? Is it something else I can be doing better as an athlete or even as a person? And it's in all areas of life. It's not just in sports. It's in the relationships you have with other people. It's in business and it's in everything else. Um, you know, one question I always like to ask uh, people that come on as guests is, if you could turn back time and talk to yourself as an 18 year old self, um, what would you tell yourself? Um, well, the one thing that I'd change, I can tell you that. Um, I, I don't think that there's anything, Brad, that I would have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so fortunate to grow up with parents that I had, <clears throat> community, the siblings that I had that supported me. You know, of, of all the things I learned in my life, growing mm -hmm. up the way that I did, I learned perseverance from them. I mean, mm. my parents were just ordinary Midwestern hardworking parents who became yeah. extraordinary parents and became extraordinary coaches. And honestly, there's nothing I could change. I grew up in this great rural town, had wonderful friends growing up. Um, yeah, at 18, I knew exactly where I was going. It was mm -hmm. the year of Title IX. I wanted and needed a scholarship in order to continue swimming. Got one at this little small school in Monmouth College. It was at the time, it's Monmouth University out in New Jersey, left Wisconsin to an area that I didn't even know, but I got this full ride to swim. I mean, what's the chance of that happening yeah. to this little, this gal in Land Lakes, Wisconsin? My goal was to be a teacher. My goal was to satisfy my scholarship and swim well for the college. Sure. Um, so I, I achieved that. I was, I was on track to do all of everything that I wanted to do from the time I was a little girl. And was it hard? Of course, Brad, you, right? You, you know what that's like. But you know, I never, I never did not, honestly, I never did not embrace it. With all the crap that goes on, with all the bad swims, with all the great swims, with yeah. all the hard practices, with all, with all of that, people saying you can't do it. I mean, in 1976, when I made the Olympic team, I was 21. Wow. I was married and considered well past my prime. Yeah. 45 years ago, there weren't any women like me. They were wow. 16 and 17 and 18. And here's yeah. this Wendy Bolio, newly married. She yeah. thinks she's going to make the Olympic team. Oh yeah, watch me. And I made it in two events. It's, yeah. it's not giving up. It's, it's finding that better self as you yeah. talk about. Well, I think you, you definitely found what I call your something special. You know, I believe that everybody has a special gift. And if you find that and nurture it and then share it with the world, what you do on a daily basis, the work or the career doesn't seem like it. You obviously were very passionate and loved what it was you're doing. And one thing I really want to talk about is basically uh, the relationship, of course, with your husband, Bernie, uh, where the two of you basically went on to um, coach Yale, uh, obviously uh, Yale University. When you were coaching, were you coaching the team any differently than the way you were coached in your youth when you were basically being brought up as an Olympic gold medalist? Or was it a lot of the same philosophies and a lot of the same things that were basically instilled into you? It, it definitely. All of those. Um, Bernie and I coached. I took the women's team. Bernie was the men's team. But we had a coach, Coach Frank Keefe, who was one of the best in the country, Olympic coaches, just phenomenal coach. And he was like Bill Palmer. Look, mm -hmm. you're going to work hard. Now, the difference, and Bernie and I talk about this often, 
The difference in college and certainly the difference at Yale, none of these kids are paid to swim. Mm. They're, they're not on an a, on a athletic scholarship. Mm. So Bernie and I and Frank absolutely admired these Yale swimmers who came to practice at 5.30 in the morning, did their intense studies all day, labs, all of that, and go back to practice at five in the afternoon. They wow. were doing double workouts yeah. and they didn't have to be there. These kids never missed practice. Mm. Uh, we worked them hard. Uh, had great times with them. Many of them, half of that team, Bernie and I still talk to on a, on a, a sure. regular basis. Yeah. And I wasn't much older than they. I mean, they were 21 and I was 25. Mm. So um, that experience was great. But we also knew Bernie and I wanted to have a family. And what we were finding at Yale, and that's probably what made it come together. Bernie was traveling. I'm traveling somewhere else. We had a two-year-old daughter at the time. We'd drive her down to New Jersey, <clears throat> drop her at my in-laws go back to Yale, I'd go with the women's team, Burn would go with the men's team, we'd come back on Sunday, drive down to New Jersey from Connecticut, pick up and do it again the next week. And at a certain point you go, you know, this isn't, this is really, we loved coaching, but we wanted a family and we wanted to be there for our family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, no, absolutely. You know, when you and I first met before we obviously um, decided to host you on a podcast, one of the Olympians, of course, that we touched upon was uh, Olympic diver Greg Luganis, who uh, certainly is one of the best uh, divers probably to ever grace the planet. And as I was a student alongside him at the University of Miami, had the pleasure, of course, of watching him and uh, really there for the very first time learned about the power of the mind and what a lot of people didn't know about because Tony Robbins had really not written about it in his book, Awaken the Giant Within, was neuro-linguistic programming. And what Greg said to me was, I get on the platform and I close my eyes and you'll see me stand there for 30 to 45 seconds. And essentially what it is I'm doing is I'm envisioning the dive in my mind so that I can then deliver it to my body. And obviously, you know, as an Olympic diver um, that, that graced the Olympic platform for, you know, a number of generations, he's known even today as probably one of the best divers. But when you were swimming, I think one of the important messages you shared is you always saw yourself as a winner. You, you saw yourself on the podium with that medal around your neck. And I think it's the power of the mind, because I tell people you have to see it here before you can deliver it to the body. And, you know, as an athlete, we all know about self-talk, especially when you're in a long distance race where your body is fatigued and your mind is saying, man, I'm tired. It's time to quit. Uh, the Navy SEALs have something called the 40% rule that says when your mind is telling you to quit, your body can still go another 60%. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, David Goggins and friends of mine that are SEALs certainly have talked about that as it relates to you've got to convince yourself that you can do it because you can but the first part of your body that wants to give up is the part up here. Uh, it's really delivering the message consistently, man, I can do this, you know, I'm, I'm powerful, I can go the distance, I can set a new record and do all of those, uh, you know, wonderful, amazing things. You know, one thing that I did not know about you that I just recently learned after doing a little bit of homework for today's uh, session, Wendy, is later in life, you know, after the Olympics and of course, uh, after the coaching, is you became a very, very uh, competitive track cyclist and then went on to win a number of medals as well. What was the decision that made you want to get into track cycling? Well, my husband was always an avid cyclist. Bernie raced all the time. He was, I met him at, at college, he was a swimmer, but always rode his bike and then, and then was racing. Mm. Um, he'd do the velodrome races, the road races. And I, you know, we had, we had three kids at the time and I was 40. And I just really, I thought that was awesome. I didn't care for road racing. What I loved was the track. Okay. Because it's a lot like the swimming pool. It's just mm. here it is, right? And, 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 it's, and, and you're very focused and it's, yeah. it's, that's your race. Um, and I love that. I, I, you know, my, my parents always said, and Bill Palmer, when he, when he got me at 18 and I was being coached by Bill, the difference Bill Palmer always said, and my parents the same thing, but Bill just always said to me, Wendy, there's a difference between you and other swimmers in the pool. The difference is you love to win and you hate to lose. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who just get in and swim and race, whatever the sport is, because they hate to lose. Yeah. No, I love to win. And that's why I can get up on the block and do the thing. And honestly, in my, in my job as a long-term care specialist, as an agent, as a wholesaler, as a trainer, mm -hmm. I've never 
thinking about, you know, because we're always told, you know, only, only the top 20% in this industry are ever going to make it. I never worried about being the top 20%. I'm just yeah. like, what? Yeah. I always strive for that. Yeah, what I want to be is number one or number two or number three, which I was in the country in terms of long-term care sales. Everything that I learned in my athletic career, everything that I am today is because of the swimming experiences that I have. And that carries me through my career, which have highs and lows like any career. Yeah. Um, COVID certainly has, has made a difference in the way that I, that I work my business. Is it easy to fold and go, well, it's COVID. I don't know that I'll ever get in front of, you know, a thousand people at a convention again. You know, there's a lot of speakers, whether they're in, the, in an industry or they're motivational, or whatever, just go, well, I guess this is my time to leave. I'm like finding ways always to get a message to individuals on health, on long-term care planning, on being the best that you can be, on not giving up. Um, because as long as I have breath in me and I can, and I can help as many people and educate as many people about that, uh, I, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, people used to say, as I said earlier, they thought I would, should be done at 21. I should, I don't, I don't have, Wendy, where do you get the nerve to think that you're just as good as anybody at 21 and married? You know, no one is going to define me. Um, yeah. Brad, when I was 18, I, there were two schools I wanted to go to. I wanted to go to SC, USC, and I wanted to go to University of Madison. I got declined from SC, and Madison was, you know, I grew up thinking about going to Madison. I knew the coaches there. I knew a lot of the swimmers who were my age group going through, um, and, and so I just, I applied. I was going to go and be a nurse. Mm -hmm. I get a letter back in, uh, in April, accepted at Madison. And I didn't get a, a letter from the coach, Pettinger. I, did, I didn't get a letter. And so about two weeks later, I get this letter going, Wendy, so excited that you're coming to University of Madison, so excited you're going to be in the nursing program, but you're not, you're not Madison swimming material. <laughs> Maybe in the fall, try as a walk-on and we'll see. Uh, I decided at 18... And, I, and I've always felt this way, but that is a reminder, and I still have the letter from him. No one is going to determine my value and my worth. I'm going to do that. And so I got this scholarship. God, isn't life amazing? I get this full ride to go to Monmouth. And, um, you know, that the rest is history. Had I gone to Madison, I probably, I, I probably wouldn't have been recognized, mm -hmm. noticed, quit. I'd be a nurse now, which would be wonderful. But yeah. God, the life I've had, all inspired by swimming, Brad, has been amazing. You know, it's about the decisions one makes that largely defines where we end up. And, and one thing that came out of what you just said that I really love is I've interviewed a lot of very talented entrepreneurs, people worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and the, the big message is that successful people don't listen to their feelings. They've got a goal and boom, it's you know full steam ahead because once you start buying into the naysayers and the limiting beliefs and the self-doubt, you're doomed. And I really just admire what you just said that you know, you've really had this vision in front of you. And of course, you know, like you said, the letter that you received wasn't in alignment with what you were looking for. And you made the decision, obviously, to move forward and go to Malmuth, which, you know, your, your, your life and your career could have been vastly different had you ended up going to another school. Um, let me ask you, as we kind of get to the, you know, top of the half hour here, if you could step into my shoes um, as an interviewer and as a host, um, what question would you ask yourself that I haven't asked yet today? Um, you know, I think because um, we haven't talked about health. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 65 years old. Um, uh, it, it, you know, people, we all have our chores every day in our, in our life. And yep. as an athlete, training was always part of that, right? As living your life, I've raised, my husband and I have raised three kids. Um, mm -hmm. But health has always been a priority for my husband and I and our kids. We've always said we may not leave them a whole lot of money when we die, but the legacy that we're leaving them, and now we have three grandchildren, a, a fourth one on the way, is being health you know, being as healthy as you can. And in COVID, nothing brings it more, more to light than what is going on in this country today. Those with compromised health conditions are at such a greater risk. The results are so devastating. If you can maintain your health, if that chore every day, if you can make health be one of those chores that you do every day, as in being fit, and there's, you know, people say to me, Wendy, you look really 
really good. What do you do? I make sure that I eat right. I grew up on a farm where my father would look at all seven of us, line us up, and he would say, if you can't hunt it, pick it, fish it, or grow it in our backyard, don't you go putting that in your mouth. <laughs> so I, you know, I, we're just not obsessed, but I'll tell you, we're very, very careful what we eat. And look, I might have cancer tomorrow. I, I, I mean, I could have a stroke tomorrow, but you know what? I'm going to do everything that I possibly can. Sleep is, is another one that's important. This nonsense of two, three hours and I'm good to go. Actually, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, your yeah. body has to recover. And when you are full down for the count sleep, that's when you recover, just as an athlete does. In my business, Brad, your business, what we do every day, the amount of stress that we go through every single day, mm -hmm. in a lot of times is worse than what I did as an athlete in terms mm -hmm. of mental stress. And the third thing is I'm always moving. I mean, I'm moving my fitness. I swim three times a week. My husband and I are outrigger canoe paddlers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm walking, I'm do I, I've always lifted weights. I mean, that is just who I am. The older I get and the message I'm always telling people on this call, young or old, and especially when you hit that 50 and 55, that help is everything. But the real key about exercise is getting blood to the brain. Yeah. Once right. you can no longer get out of that chair, yeah. that blood is not getting to the brain. And those are the dementia. Those are the Parkinson's. Those are the Alzheimer's. Um, you've got to get blood to the brain. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think that you certainly have a place standing alongside Jack LaLanne, who <laughs> even at his age was a model when it came to fitness. Uh, and I admire, of course, him being kind of the poster child, yeah. uh, doing all the things that he accomplished as a obviously, you know, elite uh, athlete, uh, even at his uh, old age doing, uh, you know, swimming and towing the rowboats and uh, everything else. But it really it comes back down to fitness. You have it to. It comes back down to choice. You have to move. There are many people in this country and in the world that, that given the circumstances, their DNA, their gene will ha right. have underlying conditions. Right. But for the most part, and I'm in the long-term care industry, I see a tremendous amount of people every day throughout this country that, that have just put everything to chance. Well, yeah, I mean, we have, a, we have a problem as a nation with fast foods and with processed foods and, of course, all of the uh, chemical additives that are put in, uh, you know, preservatives and things. Uh, we live in a society of convenience. And so if somebody can go do a drive through and, you know, pick up a Chick-fil-A or a McDonald's or whatever, uh, you know, that's largely what our society, of course, diets on. And the unfortunate thing is that contributes, as we know, to obesity and to diabetes and a lot of other issues and it gets back to like you said you know if you can't kill it if you can't grow it if you can't uh you know find it in your backyard without the insecticides you don't want to put it in your mouth uh, let's face it we you know as an athlete um we yeah consume eight ten twelve thousand brad you know this calories a day yeah. you know unless you're a michael phelps yeah. Ryan Lochte, you know, Usain Bolt, you know, these elite guys, the NFL, the, yeah. you, you and I, we just don't need that much food. Right. We really don't need, we the, are the only species that goes and looks at our watch and goes, gee, it's lunchtime. Mm -hmm. No, you know, I don't eat anything before noon. Mm -hmm. I don't eat any, because I'm not hungry. I just ate dinner at six o'clock at night. I don't do enough. And I work out hour and a half, two hours every day. Mm -hmm. But well, I just don't do enough to require that kind of calories. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I love it. You have to definitely focus. And I'm a big believer of uh, long-term care and uh, the insurance, of course, that I know you're so passionate about as well. Let me ask, um, where can people learn more about Wendy? Where, where can we go to, uh, you know, learn more about you? Uh, of course, um, you know, information that you might want to share with the public. Sure. You know, years ago, I had a website, but yep. I realized that I'm not selling anything, right? So websites to me, for me, for what I do as a long-term care specialist, and I'm a speaker, yep. um, Olympic athlete, we've got two great films out, The Last Gold and Doping for Gold, mm -hmm. um, based on the Montreal Olympic Games. Yeah. But I work with this great, uh, this great team, mm -hmm. um, Roseanne Morrison and yep. Chris Dunworth at Roe Morrison Agency. And I'm a speaker on her bureau. And, and what I love to do are our podcasts, our calls, our, you know, again, I was at Wells Fargo the other, yesterday, giving a speech, um, New York Life. All these, where we have clients in the audiences, just like this, look, my audience is different because now it's Zoom. Yep. But my goal is always to inspire people to look at long-term care planning. 
might not be insurance, Brad, but look at the ways that if you and I needed care today or in the future, our future of living, what does that look like? And how can I help mitigate the risk? Because swimming was the same way, right? You got to mitigate the risk. You train, but you know that there's going to be an illness or a sickness. So how do I minimize that yeah. and maximize my strength? And with financially, having a great financial professional, uh, I've been fortunate with Ro Morrison. Um, she's just a great friend mm -hmm. and colleague. Um, and so we've worked really hard together so they can always look there uh, and, 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 you know, email Ro uh, Morrison or just give her a call. Wonderful. Great, great. Well, folks, you heard it here today from Wendy Bolio, former Olympic gold medalist, part of the 1976 Montreal team what it means to be a champion, what it means to go pro. Wendy, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and sharing your wisdom. This has been another great interview, and we look forward to bringing you more talented people from sports, business, and politics on Yahoo Finance and Yahoo News number two podcast, Beast Nation. Folks, we'll be back in a couple of days with another wonderful guest. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thanks, Brad.